Music City Social is produced by Star Maker PR Group, providing publicity and public relations services to the entertainment industry. Learn more at StarMakerPR.com. My guest today is singer, songwriter, music publisher, Andy Childs. Andy moved to Nashville from Memphis in the 1980s, but really, his career was already in full swing. Which begs the question, do you really have to live in LA, New York, or Nashville to have a recording career? After a solo deal with RCA Records in 1994, Andy continued to write, record, and perform, which led to his position as lead singer in the progressive country music band Sixwire. In 2002, Andy and Sixwire signed a recording contract with Warner Brothers Records and released one album. The album did well, but as many music artists have learned, the vested interest of the personnel at the record label has everything to do with the success of an artist. Andy, welcome to Music City Social. Andy, you were born right down the street in Memphis, Tennessee, and what drew you into Nashville? You know, the thing about Memphis, Tennessee is, is that whereas historically Memphis is one of the most important cities on this entire planet, and I'd love to tell you more about that, but when it came to actual music business and being involved in pop country music, which is the way that I always saw myself when I was a young man, um, you have to come to Nashville. I mean, there's really only three big music cities in this in this country. True. Uh, where music business infrastructure all exists. And, uh, you know, that's Nashville, L.A., and New York. Nashville was the obvious place for me. It was three hours down the road. In 1994, you had a solo record deal with RCA Records. And then more recently, a record deal with your band Six Wire on Warner Brothers. And that was, I believe, in 2002. <laughs> You're a rare case in that you've had two record deals. So tell us what that's like to 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 find and go through two structured record deals with with major labels. Well, the the first one certainly prepared me for the second one. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it um, I, and I had a great time both times. I didn't. Um, it, my records didn't set the world on fire, but I really, really had fun. I got to do a lot of cool things. And um, working with RCA was a dream come true at the time. And um, everything was going so well in Nashville for all of the labels that most of the labels were opening a second label. Right. Yeah, you know, Arista had career and, um, yeah, I think Capital had, or Liberty at the time had Freedom or Patriot Records. And RCA had BNA. Um, but but signing with RCA was a, was a big deal. You know, there were a lot of... Um, historic um, iconic stars that had recorded for RCA and uh, it was a thrill and a dream come true and and um, it, it was fun doing records for RCA and making music videos and then getting to tour not only with Martina and Clint Black and some of the RCA artists but um, everybody else that was big in those days I got to go out and, and tour pretty much with everybody and great great time. Now, there's eight different ways to get a record deal. And one of our previous guests recorded a demo with a producer, and the producer was the link to the label. How, how did your RCA deal come to be? I signed with Sony first. You know, interestingly, they're now one and the same. Um, but I had a development deal with Sony. And Sony uh, passed. You know, I recorded this project at House of David. And... Uh, um, when I finished the project, they decided not to pick me up as an artist, you know, in a full-blown recording contract. Right. But it caught the attention of an A&R assistant at RCA, and she took it to the head of A&R, and he liked it and wanted to see a live show, and we set one up, and, you know, then he signed me to RCA. Now, not looking to blame uh, a, a label or marketing PR, but when a record doesn't lift off, who is to blame? Is that the label? Is that their marketing department? What? How does how does a record fail? There are there are so many ways. Um, you know, when you're setting up a, a record release, when you try to make the best product you know how to make, and the best creation of artistic work that you possibly can, and and then you cross your fingers, you say a prayer, and you and you you put your child out there into the world. <laughs> Uh, but setting up a record release is like setting up dominoes when you want to make them all fall a certain way and sure. make a pattern, you know. And if one is out of place just a little bit, it can stop the whole thing. And you've got to either set it all back up or just go, eh, maybe I'm not meant for dominoes. <laughs> and um, I think there were a number of mistakes uh, by the record company at the time 
that I was recording for RCA, but only because they were in a, a constant state of flux. There was um, Joe Galani wasn't here when I was signed uh, to RCA. He came back during the time I was at RCA. The A and R had changed um, two or three times while I was there. The That's promotion common. team changed. Yeah, the head of promotion was was brand new as a head of promotion. There were a lot of things like that. But the mistakes made by the record company were no larger than the mistakes that I made myself. I was I was struggling trying to determine, you know, about management. I made some bad choices. Um, you know, there there were I made I equally made a lot of mistakes, which is in some way that's why I say that the first recording contract prepared me for the second one. Well, tell us about that. How was the second one different than the first? I, I, I knew everything that was going to happen, wow. uh, even the bad things. <laughs> I, I could I could always see them coming. I knew exactly what was going to happen and what wasn't going to happen. And um, the, the best part about it, though, was that I had already established a really terrific relationship with many people in radio across the country, program directors, music directors, and... and um, I had created my own, uh, Aaron Tippin had showed me how to do it, but I did a little database for myself when I was recording for RCA and I was touring promoting that album. And, um, you know, I had a little database. I had notes and information about every programmer that I very had met around the country. It was very good. So that when Six Wire, you know, when we hit the road for Warner Brothers and we were promoting our single, I knew a lot of people. Most of them I knew from memory, but I still had this database that I could go back and refer to and refresh my memory on when I had been there. As you know, in radio, program directors often have to leave the city they're in and go to another one, and Mm. it happens a lot. They're more transient than anybody I've ever seen. Interesting. A guest that is going to be on the show in about two months, uh, very well known, won't put his name out right now, but one of the intriguing things we'll talk about was his first album, uh, major label, uh, had a top 10 single. And at the end of uh, his first year with this deal, a top 10 single, uh, touring over 200 dates that year, he was $375,000 in debt. So <laughs> let's say that happens. Let's say with Six Wire. <laughs> I, I was as well with yeah. RCA. I was about that deep. My question is, whose responsibility is that debt? Uh, for an album or a tour that it doesn't quite do what everyone had hoped. Well, it it, um, it falls to the record company. So when people begin to complain about record companies as the big, bad, evil record company, it's not so much that way. They're putting up a lot of money. Tim Dubois told me one time um, that, who at the time he was head of Arista Records, and I was negotiating with Arista Records when I had been let go from RCA about possibly going over there. This was before we started Six Wire. And Tim Dubois looked at me and he said, Mister, it costs us $600,000 just to roll the dice. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. I mean, that was the way that it was. Um, you know, they, they spent more money in those days. We don't have to spend that much these days. But back then, that was the way it was done. The first album I made for RCA cost a quarter of a million dollars. The music videos each were seventy or 80000 a piece, and I did three. Um, and then I made two more albums for RCA and... Um, you know, they one was maybe one hundred fifty thousand, another was seventy or eighty thousand. Addition, you know, that's we're getting towards a million dollars. That's here. a lot of money. So it, um, but if it doesn't succeed, that's their loss, and I walk away. And there's that's just the way that it is. Interesting. Keep in mind, though, that if you do succeed, um, you the the artist pays for it. Um, those all of the all of the production costs for those albums comes out of the artist's take of the royalties, and the artist gets one of the lowest percentages of anyone in the whole camp. So this is a it's a loan with a marketing plan. Pretty much a loan, but it's a loan that you do not have to pay back if you're not successful. If you are successful, you have to pay it back. Gotcha. So if you're not a platinum artist in those days, it's changing now. The whole business is different now. But in those days, if you weren't a platinum selling artist, meaning you moved a million units. Right. Um, you were not going to recoup on your deal and you would always be in debt to the record company until you were a multi-platinum artist and then it, and then they renegotiate with you. Interesting. Well, and I want to talk about the changes in the music industry in just a minute, but sure. in 2007, your band Six Wire was on the Fox television show, The Next Great American Band. You guys secured second place out of 10,000 entries, which, I mean, that's amazing. Tell us a little bit about the experience of being on national television week after week. 
Well, it was a uh, for me. It was a blast the whole time. Um, it wasn't uh, the first time that for any of us really that we had been on national television. But it was the first time that um, you know. So there were part there were aspects of it that weren't new to us, right? And for me, it wasn't even due to be a contestant because I had a pretty good run on uh, Star Search way back when. And uh, before I signed to RCA uh, in the early, early 90s, I had a pretty good run on Star Search, came in second there as well. And so the experience wasn't foreign to me. But the interesting thing about it is, is that having had a recording deal as a solo artist in the early nineties and then having another recording deal with six wire on Warner brothers in 2002 with a single that was around top 20 on at least one chart and, um, going through all of those things by the time 2007 rolled around, I was beginning to try to figure out exactly what I was going to do next. I really didn't expect for six wire to get picked up doing anything at that point. And my partner, Steve Mandel, came to me and said, there's this show that American Idol is going to do. And it, it was vaguely going to be called American Band at the time. It ended up being called the Next Great American Band. And we, um, I was skeptic. Steve wanted to do it. And I ended up having a great time. I, I think I enjoyed every minute of it. Even looking back, you know, even there were a couple of tense moments, but not so much. You know, we, we moved to L.A. for the entire run of the show. Uh, they put us up in a wonderful apartment, um, and uh, we were right down the street from the studio. We could walk to CBS Television City, which is where they did the Carol Burnett show, and that's where they do American Idol. We could walk to the studio. Um, it was great fun. I didn't drive a car for three and a half months, you know, because they took us everywhere we needed to go, and uh, what a great time. And yeah. being on national television... My, my approach, and, and I used to talk to the guys about this, I would say, wow, guys, you know, yes, this is a competition, but when, when it comes to performances, let's don't think of it that way. When we walk out there, let's, let's try to prepare as if we were going on The Tonight Show or something. Every time we walk out, let's go out as if we're about to go on Jay Leno or David Letterman. Let's do the best performance we can under the parameters that we've been given. Because this could be our only week on television, or it might be our last week on television as far as this television show goes. And we're very, very fortunate to be able to be on the program for the entire run of the season, uh, all the way into the finale show, which had us doing you know lots of extra numbers and it was it was great fun with me i watched the entire uh show Bless your you heart. guys you guys delivered <laughs> i mean without a doubt you were the most polished put together band on the show the harmonies were like the eagles <laughs> and i think people responded to that they saw a very uh rehearsed band with great original songs and so uh, yeah we we that was a that was another thing that was fortunate that's one of the highlights for me was the fact that steve and i were able to put songs that we had written for six wire into the television show right. and that they let us perform some of our original music that was a that was very special for me so six wire uh it had been a couple of years since the album was released mm-hmm. you're on a national television show you play second what did you expect would happen when you returned to Nashville after the show ended? When, when Steve convinced me to do the show, we, we went after that show um, with the hopes to just make it through half the show. I think Steve wanted to win. I just wanted to be on half the time because in those days, especially with American Idol, even the runner-up, sometimes you could place fifth and still land a new recording contract. Right. And we had a lot of new material. We had a lot of new songs. We really wanted another opportunity for Six Wire, even though I was doubtful about, you know, whether one would come or not. And then this television show comes along, and out of 10,000 entries, we get chosen to audition. uh, And out of 200 auditions, we get chosen to be in the final 12 that went on television. Right. So it began to shore up my confidence in Six Wire. And... I was absolutely certain that we would be offered another recording contract by someone, if not by 19 Entertainment, which was American Idol, um, when the show was completed. And that was um, that was my expectation would be that 10 to 12 weeks on national television would launch a new start for Six Wire. Interesting. So at the time, you thought maybe this is the rebirth of Six Wire. 
Yeah. And why do you think uh, a, a label didn't step up uh, at that two, time? Two labels did. Unfortunately, our contract with American Idol forbade us signing oh, with anyone else. Oh, goodness. And I, I won't say anything negative about that company because I had a blast working for 19 Entertainment. And we are very, very good friends with Nigel Lithgow and his son, Simon. They have a production company together. Uh, they have certainly incorporated us into so many things since then, and it's a thrill. But my my one complaint would be that it was difficult to get any communication. I wanted them to release us from our agreement with them so that we could sign with someone else, and I could not even get communication. So <laughs> that's the way that goes. Um, and we lost our window. You know, you got a little time when you're on national television and you're making a big splash. You got a little time. You've got a window and you need to capitalize on it. And as the winners of the show, um, the Clark brothers, as they found out when that window was lost, you can't get it back. Well, they, you know, they were a great team, uh, very talented, but they, in my opinion, they fell off the map within a month of the show ending. I've Yeah, I... I I don't know exactly what happened. I only know what I saw. Um, and uh, they um, a year went by before I heard anything, and then they changed their name. And I think they've made a couple of albums, but I don't think it's been terribly successful. And I love those kids. I spent yeah. a lot of time with them. I call them kids. You know, they're younger than me. <laughs> and, I, uh, <laughs> and you're um, 30. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I spent a lot of time with them when we were the whole time we were on the television show. And I just I love those guys, and they're extremely talented. But I I do think that that was mishandled, and I don't know whether it was them or the people handling them. But I think they had a golden opportunity that was really mishandled. Wow. Well, apparently television is attracted <laughs> to Six Wire because currently <laughs> you, as a band, perform uh, as Raina James' band on the hit television show Nashville. So yeah. How, yeah. how in the world do you become the band on a television show? Well, I guess we've, we've become one of those bands that gets called for lots of television things. We, before we were contestants on The Next Great American Band, most of us had been involved in a show called Nashville Star, which was on USA Network. And we went, um, after being contestants on the Next Great American Band, before we even left Los Angeles, the production company had hired us to be the house band on a show called Can You Duet, which was on CMT. My partner, Steve Mandel, was the music director for that show, and we were the house band for that show. And we did that for two seasons. And there were... Uh, it was related to what we had done in L.A. with the Next Great American Band. Uh, like I said, we were already hired for that before we even finished the show in Interesting. L.A. And um, following Can You Duet, the same uh, Nigel Lithgow and his son Simon developed another television show called CMT's Next Superstar, which uh, aired last year. And likewise, um, Steve was music director and associate producer, and then we were uh, um, the house band for that show as well. So we were, it just seemed like every time you look up in the last, you know, five, six years, Six Wires on television yeah. all the time and on some TV show, either as a house band or a contestant or making some cameo appearance. And um, I guess that made it so that the producers of ABC's Nashville, when they needed a veteran looking band to be behind their lead character, Raina James, played by Connie Britton, they could make one call. <laughs> rather right. than try to piece together a band to be behind her. And they can make one call and get six wire and then supplement with a couple of other players. So it, it worked out really, really well. It's a fun show. That's neat. Now, it appears when watching the show that you're actually playing the music. And we I'm, are. I'm, you are. Mm -hmm. you, so you played on the recordings. What, what you hear, I mean, this is the thing. We, we The music is pre-recorded, and then we, when it comes time to show it, um, we're playing live along with the recording. Gotcha. And they are able to capture ambience in the room and some of the live sound and combine that with what's pre-recorded. It's actually really, really great that way. And Connie's like doing her own singing, and so is Hayden Panettiere. They're, and uh, Chip uh, Eston, Charles Eston, is doing his own as, as wow. the character Deacon. Everybody's doing their own singing. The, with this show, they're very concerned about realism. And whereas for me, for us, it's the first dramatic 
show that we've ever been involved in. Everything else has been a live concert type series or reality type series. This is a dramatic show. So in, in essence, we're acting like we're musicians. Right, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's great fun. They pay a lot of attention to detail. Their first couple of days meeting with us on the set, they asked us a thousand questions about how things would work, about what the dynamic between a veteran group of musicians behind a veteran artist would be. And guys in, in Six Wire have played behind a ton of other Everyone. artists, including <laughs> Faith Hill, who you can yeah. see some obvious... Um, uh, comparisons that maybe people outside make uh, to the character of Raina James and a, a veteran act like Faith Hill. And some of us played behind Faith Hill. So they asked us a lot of questions about what that dynamic would be like, and they paid great attention to detail. Even when we're on set shooting, they'll turn to the band and say, would it be this way? Would these speakers be here? Interesting. How would this go? And they, um, I think they've tried to make it real. It's It's terrific. It's fun. That's cool. Now, the first two episodes are out. And so far, uh, you've pretty much been the band. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but will we see more of you guys? Will you interact with the, the, the lead actors at any point in the show? As far as having lines, um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know that uh, <laughs> I, can, I can only say certain things. I okay? gotcha. So, gotcha. But here's what I can say. Um, the, the appearance of, of Six Wire or the guys in Six Wire that are in Raina's band it is determined by whether the character of Raina is touring or not. Gotcha. There have to be live performances in big, order for us to be Being part uh, of the featured. plot right now. Right. Yeah. So you have to follow the plot in order to understand uh, that Raina's tour is in question. You right. Know, there's, only been, there's only been two shows aired so far. I, mm. I know a little bit about what's happening in the future, but, um, you know, at, at the moment, her tour is in question. Gotcha. So, you know, that... You'd have to kind of stay tuned. You know? All right. That, that's good. Now, you mentioned Steve Mandel. He's mm -hmm. been a creative partner with you in Six Wire and, yeah. and other things. But you've recently begun assembling Veritable Music. Yes. That will be a high-end boutique music publishing company here yeah. in Nashville. Yeah. You're funded. You have a plan. What does a new music publishing company do as its first step in Nashville? All I can tell you is that it is a very, very exciting time to be in the music business where some of the older school people are hand ringers and mourning the loss of the way things used to be. Sure. That doesn't really matter to us. Um, we, in some ways, uh, me as a solo artist, Six Wire as a group, when it came to record companies, large record companies with big, you know, uh, a and R teams and big CEOs whose dry cleaning bill could fund our publishing company, um, we've been a victim of the old school way. Sure. <laughs> and so as writers um, and as publishers, we wanted to do something that embraced the way things are now. Um, direct access to music for fans is an amazing concept when you think about it. And the lack of um, physical product and shipping and distribution like that can be a real plus if you look at it like a plus. So via the internet, which used to be the big bad enemy because of free file sharing and people that abuse that, well, once once it's all figured out, you know, and everything's legal, and the more legal sites there are out there, the better, and fans have direct access to, to music. It makes it an exciting time because basically anybody can do this. Anybody can get into it. And then it comes down to Best song win. Quality. Yeah. 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 And you and Steve are seasoned, award winning well, Steve, songwriters. My and, partner Steve Mandel is is brilliant. He's a brilliant producer and songwriter. Uh he's he's produced some terrific records. And most recently he had a cut or two on uh Ronnie Dunn's um, solo album, you know, post Brooks and Dunn, and and uh, but prior to that, he did Erica Joe's album. She was one of the Nashville star winners, and he did uh, George Canyon's album, some of it. Uh, Canadian artist who also had been on Nashville Star, and Steve's had songs and movies and television, and he's he's just really really terrific. I've had a handful of good cuts myself, and Steve and I work together very well. We've known each other a long time and we work together very well. And um, we each have uh, strengths, I think, that shore up one another. We wanted to do this. This uh, we, we had been talking about doing a publishing company ever since right after we were on the American Band Show on Fox. We, we had talked about doing a publishing company, publishing slash production, maybe making Six Wire's next release be totally independent of everybody else and do it through our own company. And that kind of spawned the idea. 
And then I was approached by an investor um, in Memphis, Tennessee, where I'm from. And she had a, um, they have a successful, you know, company that's not related to the music business at all, but they had some interest in music publishing. And they began to ask me a great deal of questions. And, and because I answered their questions with, with some knowledge about it, because I answered their questions uh, to their satisfaction, they asked more questions and eventually asked me if I would be interested in starting a music publishing company with them doing the funding as an investment for them. And we already had a plan in place. I just went to Steve and said, I think I have um, some capital for us to work with to start this. So then Veritable Music was born. And uh, now we're getting launched. That's excellent. Now, I, I use the word boutique when yeah. I described you guys because uh, in addition to you and Steve writing, your goal, as I understand, is to hire two full-time staff writers. So yeah. <laughs> how in a city that is overflowing with songwriters and songwriter talent, how do you find the two uh, that fit veritable music the best? That's, that's really it. I mean, in a, in a way, you answered the question by saying we're looking for, we actually would like to sign three, and we actually are looking for the three that fit veritable music the best. Right. <laughs> and that's, how we, right. that's our criteria. But, but if you understand that even, even the name veritable music, um, veritable is, a, is an adjective that strengthens a descriptive word. You know, like if you go, you have Thanksgiving and there's way too much food and you say, oh, it was a veritable feast. You yeah. Know? Well, we thought, um, I thought of the word veritable for music because it, it meant real. It strengthened the word. And when I thought veritable music, I meant, wow, we're not, we're, we're going to make everything we do we're going to put quality behind it and make it real. Steve and I have always done that. At least we feel that we have. And that's been our goal was to always pour ourselves into what we were doing. And by boutique, you, you have, a, you have, a, I, I agree with you. It's a, it's a small company um, that doesn't necessarily specialize in any one format, but it is a small company where the two guys that own it and run it are also writers there. Right. And with the writers that we sign, we, we want to have a real um, team atmosphere, a real family atmosphere. We'll do lots of demos together. We'll have demo day where we're all in the studio, you know, cutting the new batch of songs that's come in. It, it's, it's, it's really, really exciting to be able to work as a team like that. We've, just, we've already hired a, a catalog manager slash a song plugger, a great young guy named Danny Berrios. And Danny had been working for EMI, and he's right out of Belmont and uh, terrific guy very knowledgeable and the thing about Danny his his youth and his energy um, are, are pushing Steve and myself to look at the new way of doing things the thing about these young guys you know that are just coming out of college and all they know all about Spotify they know all about SoundCloud sure. they know all about all these new ways of getting music and getting it into other people's hands and Danny brings that knowledge and he brings that energy when we we're out on the street Danny Danny young guy he keeps running into people he knows you know that's arguably me. as many as we know well you and Steve know everyone and that's kind of my next <laughs> question is do you look at your immediate circle of influence looking for writers or is it a cattle call an audition process I mean no I, I mean I, no we're we're actually talking to people that we know to a certain extent, yeah, it is this the circle of people that we know, but we're asking them about about young writers. Not not the, and, I, and I wouldn't say that we're um, that we're close to having uh, an older established writer, but you have to think in terms of the fact that S Steve and I we kind of have old school covered. <laughs> we're we're the elder statesmen of this company, and and we've had you know, we've had hits with uh, between Steve and myself. We've had hits with uh, Tim McGraw and Chris K Chris Cagle and uh, you know Carolyn Don Johnson and Phil Vassar and you know so so really um, we kind of feel like we have the the older way of doing things and the elder writers done. What we're looking for is is energy and and youth and uh, or youthful energy even if it's not attached to physical youth <laughs> and because we um, we're looking for people that are on fire to do what they do and um, it, it's that's exciting to us and that's the reason that we hired Danny Barrios he's a he's a younger guy and he he sees things he's still wide-eyed and looking at the 
at the city, not like, oh my goodness, look at the terrible state the music business is in. He's looking at it like, wow, look at all the opportunity that's out right. there right now. Yeah. Vince and that's Gale the way said, that we see it. Vince Gill said the music business is a young man's game. <laughs> and Well, uh, and, you and, and Steve are young. And he's right. Yeah, you and, and Steve are young though. And you write yeah. young, your, your attitudes are young. And so I think you're doing a, a good job <laughs> in assembling this. Yeah, you know, Vince, Vince is right when he says that, but Vince may be saying it from a different standpoint. <laughs> than us. I, mean, I, I don't, um, uh, wow, you know, Vince Gill is one of my favorite artists there's ever been in this town. Um, and, uh, but I don't, um, you know, wow. Um, I had um, a development deal with Sony. I had um, a record deal with RCA. I had several singles and music videos out. I, I wrote for EMI music for four years. I was in a EMI production agreement thing. I was in the same camp with uh, Brad Paisley and uh, Daryl Worley and all, uh, you know, and then Six Wire, you know, signing to Warner Brothers and having some records out. And when I look at all of those things and I, and I see that y- your measure of, of success you know, by, by some people's measurements, none of those projects were successful. By mine, I look at it and go, wow, look at all the cool stuff I got to do. And the fact that I've never had to have a job outside of the music business my entire life, even from when I was a teenager. I don't bemoan Music Row or anything for the fact that I didn't become a household name. And even now looking at it and thinking in terms of whether it's a young man's game or not. Yeah. If I was still chasing an artist deal, um, you know, it, it's my chances, um, you know, turning about to turn 50 years old. My chances are different from a kid who's uh, in his 20s, certainly. But so what? Right. You know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. That's that's why I mean, we're, Six Wire is going to keep touring when we can. We're going to try to make another record in the spring, but we're going to do it through our own company. And, you know, we'd, we'd love to be successful with Six Wire again, have something on the radio or whatever. But at the same time, I'm equally excited about continuing to write songs that maybe some of these young guys will cut. I'm, con- I'm equally or even more so excited about starting my own company with my partner, Steve, Veritable Music, that is going to infuse what we do into the music business as it is now. It's It's just such an exciting time. So you can, I don't know, you can mourn the way things were and the loss of that or well, you can you look guys, at it and go wow what a great time as I said you guys are, are young you're perceived young and I understand the attitude of of someone wanting a record deal that being 21 would make it perhaps easier sure but the knowledge that you and Steve share that's definitely going to structure how things run for veritable music and you can't buy knowledge and like I, you I guess guys that's true. have that's you, true. As as there's a line from the show Nashville, and I don't know if it's aired yet, but I'm going to go ahead and Chip says it. You know, the t- character of Deacon, he says, "Well, that's the thing about experience. There's only one way to get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth." So I'm working that line into every conversation now. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, Andy, tell us a little bit about growing up in Memphis, and you know, the transition from Memphis to Nashville. I was born in Memphis. And I was aware of where I was and how important it was in the music business by the time I was even in my early teens, if not before. I mean, we, I actually, when I was uh, about six or seven years old, met Elvis Presley in his front yard of his house, you know, my because we drove goodness. by it every Sunday. And um, I remember uh, my dad taking one of my brothers and me, and we were on our way to my grandmother's house. And Elvis was sitting on a horse and the gates were open and there were a handful of fans inside the gates. And dad said, let's go see if we can meet him. So we did. And I remember looking up at Elvis and this would have been about 1969. And that's, that's significant. And I'll tell you why in a second. But I remember looking up at Elvis, his hair was a little longer than what I knew from television and all. And he he looked absolutely great. (laughs) He was a, a, what a beautiful man, you know, takes a real man to be able to say that. (laughs) Uh, But he, uh, uh, he looked great. And, and, um, at the time, and I, now I know this, at the time in 1969, Elvis had a new lease on his career. He had been making all of these movies that he was very disappointed in the um, um, scripts and the kind music that was going gum. into it. Yeah, yeah. He, really, he really was disappointed in that. So he did a couple of things. One, he wanted to return to live performing, so he booked a bunch of shows in Las Vegas. And this is immediately following a very, very successful television special that he did for NBC for the Singer Company. And... 
so now <clears throat> the task at hand for Elvis was to make new records that were relevant, not just records that were going into these movies. And what he did was he returned to Memphis to make these records. Going back, that's where he started, you know, in, in the early 1950s, a small recording studio known as Memphis Recording Service that was owned and operated by Sam Phillips. Sam was um, credited with uh, having the first rock and roll record ever, according to most music historians, a thing called Rocket 88. That was, uh, that was Ike Turner's band called Jackie Brinston and his Delta Cats, but it was really Ike Turner's band. Most music historians will agree that's the first rock and roll record. Um, and that was recorded right there <clears throat> at, at Sam Phillips Place, which was the home of Sun Records. Sam was looking for something different. 1953, Elvis walks in to make a present for his mother, probably just to meet Sam Phillips, but that was his excuse for coming in. And they recorded a couple things. Sam wasn't real sure about it, but within one year, he brought him back into the studio and he put him with Scotty Moore on guitar, Bill Black on bass. And here's Elvis trying some standards and singing Harbor Lights by the Platters and you know not capturing any magic until late that night when the magic happened. And Elvis sang this blues song that he knew by Arthur Big Boy Crudup called That's All Right. He was just goofing around. They were taking a break. And Sam loved what he heard, and he, they recorded it on the spot. And, like, and very shortly thereafter, they had, um, they had him on the air on uh, uh, Dewey Phillips' Red Hot and Blue radio show, which was kind of a big mover, shaker radio show at the time that was playing a lot of soul hits and all. Um, and uh, that was July 5th, 1954. Nothing that we've done since then can say that it wasn't influenced by that day. And that was in Memphis, Tennessee. And it didn't stop there. I mean, then Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, Carl Perkins, all these great iconic stars started on Stax, on, on, on uh, Sun Records. Then Stax Records came along, and you had the likes of Wilson Pickett, Otis Redding, Sam and Dave. And... Then lightning struck a third time with a studio called American Sound Studios. It was owned by Chips Moman. And this was the magic that Elvis wanted to get his hands on because they were making all the Neil Diamond records, which included Sweet Caroline and all that. They were making all the B.J. Thomas records that were popular in those days. And Elvis went there to record, and he asked Chips, you know, find songs. You know, we got to find relevant songs that are, that are what's going to work for Elvis today. And, um, and they did. You know, they found songs by Mark James, uh, Suspicious Minds, and, and uh, uh, You Were Always On My Mind. And they found songs by Mac Davis, you know, that, that were brought in, like, in the ghetto. And, and they just, uh, they cut some great records in that batch of uh, music, including Suspicious Minds. And that helped to put Elvis back. That was the last number one he had while he was still alive. And that was cut in Memphis, Tennessee. Not to mention all those other artists that came out of Memphis. Well, I was aware of this by the time I was a teenager. So making a short story long, <laughs> um, none of those facts were wasted on me. And I was very, very lucky in my early career, right out of college, to get to work with a lot of those stars, wow. you know, like Sam and Dave and uh, Carl Perkins. And um, uh, it, it, was, it was really interesting, you know, to get to do that. And, uh, and I, was, I was always, um, you know, aware of the history and how important that was. And I, would, I, don't, I really honestly don't think that there is a city when it comes to the history of making music or making records. I don't think that there is a city on this entire planet that's more important than Memphis, Tennessee is because of the influence of those early days and the first handful of icons. I don't even think there's a close second. That's not to say that Nashville is unimportant. Of course it is. That's not, it's, but it's not the same thing. That's not what I'm talking about. Elvis Presley was the first global multimedia superstar. And you can't ever have that again. You can't ever have the first one again. And, there were, and Memphis, Tennessee was the cradle for that, the birth of that rock and roll child, you know. And that's why it's such an amazing place. And they still, even to this day, there are things that come out of Memphis that people don't necessarily know come out of Memphis that are really, really cool. Like in the last 20 years, like the Gin Blossoms and Sister Hazel, you know, they cut a lot of their records in Memphis. ZZ Top used to cut tons of their records in, in Memphis. And it, and it continues. It's not a music business city like Nashville is, but there's a vibe down there that is really, really cool. And I love to go back every time I go back. I live here in Nashville, but I go back to Memphis every chance I get. My family's still there. Sometimes I record down there. I go down there to work and play music. And what a great, great, great place. Yeah. And, uh, well, and let me ask you this. Will, will Memphis be a tool for veritable music? Will you record there? Um, how Will you use it? We talked about that a little bit, especially because our investment partner comes from Memphis. And 
uh, and because of my love for Memphis, I I will not in any way overlook Memphis as a source for maybe our next you know writer that we sign. Right. Um, as far as recording down there, that's not practical for us. It doesn't mean we wouldn't do it if if I was going to be there and I needed to cut something. There's some great studios in in Memphis, but um, it wouldn't be practical for us to record down there. However, uh, I want I want to work a little bit with. Um, uh, the Memphis Music Foundation, which is uh, down there, a great guy runs that, and uh, they're really trying to educate some of the local talent on how the music business works, and more importantly, how it doesn't work. And uh, I'd love to be a part of that. I, I, I've thought already about going down there and taking uh, Steve and myself, and maybe some other uh, veteran writers, and doing a little seminar, a writers round, and uh, talk to the music community, and you know, see if we can kind of influence things a little bit. I think that would be very well received. There, I hope so. With your experience, especially. So. I, I hope so. I hope that they don't, uh, you know, perceive it as, uh, you know, this, you know, coming from Nashville and trying to tell them how things work, because that's not the way that it is. But it, um, uh, I, I think it's better when everybody works together. This is a great state. Tennessee is a great state. We have, we have, uh, three different regions, three different dialects. We have, right. you know, three, you know, areas of major tourism and <clears throat> the music business. When you think about it with what we have from, you know, the foothills of Appalachia to what we have in Nashville to what we had in Memphis, it's an amazing, amazing place to live. Yeah. We talked about changes in the music business, obviously the move from pressing a record and CDs moving to digital distribution and MP3s. Everyone can record at home now, and with yeah. the right tools, they could record an album. How important is the studio anymore? Because you mentioned Memphis. <laughs> there's a couple of rooms there yeah. that magic happened. Was it the room? Was it the people, the microphone? What? Tell me about that. I think that when it comes to Sun Studio, um, Sun Records and you know Memphis Recording Service, you know, it was a, it was a small room, um, interesting vibe there. Um, as to whether the room has some kind of magic sound or not, I, I don't know. I, and, and what difference that would make now, I, I don't know. Probably none. But when it comes down to it, because of the history of that room and the fact that you still can use that studio, that very room, you can go down there and record right now. They have tours all day, but after 6 o'clock at night, it's a studio. And if you want to go down there and record maybe just your vocals, you can go stand right where Elvis Presley stood wow. and record your vocals. That makes that a unique place. And and like the city is important, that makes it one of the most important recording studios in the world, especially with the technology we have. I've had people argue with me about wanting to cut it the old way and use old machines and use analog, and I have no interest in that. We I, to me, it's the vibe and the room and, and all that. We have digital things and you have people that will say, well, analog's warmer. And I say, whatever, I got converters that'll fix that. Yeah. You know? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm all about new technology and digital recording, but capturing a vibe is something else. And at home in your bedroom, you can do a lot of things with recording gear. You know, you can, you can do your vocals, you can do a lot of stuff. But wow, can you really capture the vibe of a live band cutting together, playing off of each other. Can you really capture that in your home studio in your spare bedroom? I, I don't think so. And that's why here in Nashville, I love studios like Quad and uh, like Sound Emporium, the B Room. I used to cut in there all the time and Omni Sound. And now a new studio that we, that we love. In fact, our office is in the same building. It's called The Parlor. It's a smaller room, but what a great, great vibe. It gets a great sound. And when we, when we track there, we're all in the room together. We, we're playing off of each other. We're listening to each other's ideas. Can you do that in your, in your home studio? I don't think so. Can you make a record in your home studio? Sure. John Mayer started his career that way. Just him and a guitar making stuff in a bedroom studio. It's amazing. But as soon as he had the budget, he was at Ocean Way in California. Right. You know? right. So I, I don't, um, you know, I doubt in spite the music business has changed and overdub rooms and studios are kind of going away because most people can go finish their overdubs at home mix at home that kind of thing yeah but will the studios ever totally go away i don't think so okay andy the reoccurring question we ask everyone who comes on the show let's say you move to nashville today but you have all of this knowledge that you've gained since the the mid 80s what are your first steps in finding work networking 
and just making a place in Nashville in the music business? I, I you know what I think <clears throat> I think I would spend a month listening um, to everyone else, <clears throat> at least a month, maybe six months. Uh, people ask me on the road, uh, especially if I'm in a higher profile show, you know, and, and uh, people ask me on the road, how do I get started? You know, and um, I usually tell them uh, part of what you've already said. I usually say on your next vacation, when you've got two weeks, come to Nashville and spend your entire vacation in Nashville. But don't worry about the music business. <clears throat> Maybe go to the Bluebird or something a couple of times, but but don't worry about the music business. Shop in the malls, eat in the restaurants, go to the parks, go to a sporting event. Decide if it's somewhere you want to live. Because if you don't live here, <clears throat> you're going to miss a lot of things. It's not impossible to have a music career from somewhere else. I have friends, you know, that were artists that never actually moved to Nashville. I think Mark Chestnut actually never moved here. But you you you, you miss the, the community spirit of Nashville and you miss the give and take between people that are in it. But if you've already made that decision to move to Nashville and you're here and it's day one, I wouldn't get in a hurry. I would sit back and I would listen. I would, I would go to every songwriter club. I'd listen to all the veteran songwriters, listen to them tell their stories. Go to those 9 o'clock shows at the Bluebird. <clears throat> go to Douglas Corner. Go to 12th and Porter. Go to 3rd and Lindsley, especially because you've got veterans like the players that do their thing there. You've got tribute bands you know, that are just doing that because even though they're working in country music, they grew up on Steely Dan, so they've got a tribute band. Go listen to everything. Listen to everybody. Ask questions. Don't spend so much time telling everybody who you are and what you're going to do. Listen to what they've done. Learn from the people that have been here, and it will help you shape who you are, not as a copycat, but to understand the business more and to understand the way creative things work more. And I think that would be, if I did it in one word, I'd say, listen. My guest today has been Andy Childs. He and creative partner Steve Mandel have opened Veritable Music, a boutique music publishing company on Music Row. Andy can be seen on ABC TV's hit television show, Nashville, every Wednesday evening. Andy, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Drew. Music City Social is produced by Star Maker PR Group, providing publicity and public relations services to the entertainment industry. Learn more at StarMakerPR.com. Promotional consideration provided by Super Rope Cinch. Secure anything with rope without ever tying or untying a knot. Learn more at SuperRopeCinch.com.